Thank you for joining us again on TV Toastmasters. I'm Ken Coombs, not only a member of TV Toastmasters, but also a member of Daylighters. And tonight, I'm pleased to welcome my guest, Kate Ristow, a noted author, folklorist. She's been a teacher, and she's a fascinating person. And I want to get you to get to know her a little bit better. Kate, so glad to have you on the show tonight. Thank you, Ken. Thanks for having me. My pleasure, indeed. So, I've already sort of given a spoiler alert, I suppose, <laughs> that you are a folklorist, and there's probably some people out there wondering, what is a folklorist? Yeah, and what does a folklorist do? Um, so folklorists basically study folklore, and folklore is all of the beliefs, the narratives, the values, the traditions that we pass on over time. So it's those stories that you, maybe your parents told you as a kid, and then you go and tell your kids. Um, an example would be my mom used to tell me um, like stories from Greek mythology, and then as I have grown up and I've thought about those stories. I've told those stories to other people in different ways and to my kid in different ways too. Does that make every author a creator of folklore? So th that's interesting because like basically folklore is it's kind of prefaced around this idea that it's something that's gonna last like and it's gonna change over time but the basic idea the core beliefs the core narrative the core story is is gonna stay with us so one of the one of the things that we've studied recently is memes right and memes are something that you share with all your friends because their stories are little snippets or things that you think are funny um, but not every meme matters. Like some memes, you know, somebody shares them and they don't, they don't get shared anymore. But there's some memes that just stick right to us and really get right to the point of things. And those are the things that folklorists are interested in because those particular things are wrapped up in um, our culture and our beliefs and who we are. So folklorists really study those, um, those things that are transmitted. Something with staying power. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. Fascinating that know what a folklorist does, but you've taught writing as well at University of Oregon mm -hmm. and Western Oregon University. Mm -hmm. Did you find that being a folklorist and studying folklore helped you to teach writing? Definitely, um, because so much of folklore for me was wrapped up in stories and narratives and the stories that we tell. So then as I started working with students and working with students writing, um, I thought a lot about like the stories they were telling and how each student was going to kind of tell a different story. And so they each had something different that they wanted to say and they thought about their world and they thought about their stories in particular ways. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my own like personal stories come from this place of like hope and positivity. Like, and so everything I write would kind of be reflected like in that way. Um, but for other students, like one of, one of my students, um, was really, really interested in like the internet, basically, right? Um, so the internet and the way that we, we share information. Um, and so all of his, his stories kind of had this like technological bent. Um, so being a folklorist just gave me an awareness of the stories that we tell and how I can work with writers to get them to tell their stories and not assume that any story is the one right story. That's a good perspective, I think. Mm -hmm. His name wasn't Ralph, was he? <laughs> So you've taught, as we talked about, and you've enjoyed that, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. What are one of your favorite memories from your teaching time? My favorite memory from my teaching time? Um, I think one of them, um, you know, as so teaching college students, right? Like, um, in some ways it's different than, than teaching littler kids, but in a lot of ways it's the same, where, you know, as you get to spring and you get to the end of the spring, like, you can just feel the antsiness in the room. And there's those days where, you know, it's beautiful and it's nice outside and the sun is shining and um, it's really hard to get to class. Like, and I even had those feelings when I was like walking to class going, Oh man. Um, and so a lot of times I would adapt my, what I was going to do in the classroom, like to the class itself. So um, I never came in with, these are the strict rigid things that I'm going to teach my students today because I would have to listen to like how they were feeling and how, how they were thinking and um, what was really going to work. Um, because if you're not aware of that, it's hard to make any like positive changes with their writing. Um, so one of those days, you know, we're walking to class, I'm walking to class, and I was like, oh, it's so nice out, and so we just move class outside, um, and Monmouth has all of these little, um, little spaces throughout the campus, and so we sat out um, in this little cement, um, oh, what's the fancy word for like the, you know, where you have all the seats and stuff. There's fancy words for that. Okay. <laughs> we sat in a fancy place um, and we just talked about the story that we had read um, and each of the students was coming to the story with all these different ideas um, and it 
it felt like the best possible way to teach a class and to work with students. Sounds uh, flexible. Yeah, flexible. And I think that's the thing that I learned over time. Um, you know, I went into my first class, my first university class teaching, like with my meticulous notes and everything that I was going to say and everything I was going to do. Um, and, you know, within like five minutes, you realize that's out the window. Like, because when a student starts talking about something and engaging in an idea or getting other kids to think differently, like, you want to stay with that thing. You don't want to. And now we need to talk about commas. <laughs> if you follow where their interest lies, you'll reach them more and they'll learn more, I mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, definitely. I've been on the teaching platform. I know what you're <laughs> talking about. But not only have you been teaching and being a folklorist, as an author, one of your, your first series was Clockbreakers, was it not? Yes. Would you like to talk about Clockbreakers a little bit? Tell us what it's about. Definitely. I love Clockbreakers. So Clockbreakers is uh, it's a middle grade book, so that's uh, grades like three and up, third grade and up, basically. Um, and it's a story about an 11 year old girl and she gets this key to go back in time. Um, and it's basically a way for me to just talk about folklore and stories. Um, and she, in the first book in the series, she goes back into Greek mythology. In the second book in the series, she goes back into Irish mythology. And so that first book, you know, we go back and we go into ancient Greek mythology and we meet the Minotaur. Like, and if you read other stories that include in Greek mythology about the Minotaur and about Perseus, and we have this hero and the hero was really important and the Minotaur is this monster. And so then when I thought about the Minotaur, who's half man and half bull, I thought, well, what about the piece that's half man and this, like, basically half man, half monster that's been stuck in this labyrinth for centuries? Like, what would he really be like? And so he has these moments where he's a monster, but he also has these incredibly human moments and, like, this loneliness from being in this, in this labyrinth. And so the kids, um, as they come into the labyrinth, you know, they meet the Minotaur and they have this experience um, but it's different than, um, yeah, kind of their expectation of what's going to happen. So much in life is different than what we expect. Mm -hmm. So that was Clockbreakers, and following that, you had a series come out called Shadow Girl, and both series are still active. Want to yeah. talk about Shadow Girl a little bit for us? Yes. So Shadow Girl, yeah, um, I was kind of thinking about it earlier um, in terms of it's basically instead of. Um, a human going into the fairy world, it's a fairy coming into our world. So we have all these ideas about what it's like to go into the fairy world, about how, you know, the fairies are going to make you, like, eat their food, and you're going to have to stay forever, and you're going to party till you die. Um, and so basically, the fairies have all these ideas about humans. So they think that, you know, humans are trying to, like, capture them and enrapture them, and um, humans are never going to let them go. Um, so this character who, um, this is a book for young adults, so it's like eighth grade and up. Um, she comes into our world kind of trying to figure out what happened when she was born and the story of like her parents and her mom um, and like kind of her background. Um, but then it's all wrapped up in that fairy folklore. Just like two different cultures in our world today expect different things of each other and sometimes they get quite surprised. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't stop with being a teacher, a folklorist, an author. You're also a, a parent, a mom. Yes. And uh, Rowan has gone through some things, and you've gone through some things with him as his mother. Would you like to talk about that a little bit, or is that yeah, good? Yeah, I think that's great. Like, um, because one of the things, um, you know, just in, in the way that I live, so much of the stories like that like my mom told me and that, um, that I think about, I've turned around and told to my son, um, and he, you know, when we were getting ready um, for him to be born, um, you know, we chose this name Rowan um, because, because of the Rowan tree. And the Rowan tree is, it's a magical tree and it has, um, you know, protective properties to like protect you from like the fairies and evil spirits and um, people who are trying to do um, bad things to you. And so when he was getting ready to be born, we already knew that we were going to have like this kid who like had a lot of possibility. Um, and when he was born, he was born with two holes in his heart. Um, yeah, and it was, you know, you, f you find out about um, two days after they're born um, because what started out as like a heartbeat of bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, turns into this heartbeat that's like and it's basically all the blood going back through the holes and going the wrong way into your heart. Um, so you could sit here, like, and he could be there, and you could hear, like, that swooshing sound wow. um, when he was first born. Um, and so, 
you know, we immediately like the cardiologist rushed, rushed in and we had all of these, these tests and um, we basically had to settle on this, this pattern of waiting. So, you know, we waited and we waited for the holes to close and eventually one of them actually did close. Um, and, you know, we went into when he was two years old and had the echocardiogram and there was only one. Um, and that was this amazing moment of, like, yeah. <laughs> and, you, and, and you didn't, like, we didn't even know it was going to happen. So it was, yeah, it was a really good moment. Um, but that, that second hole, um, just kind of over time, he kept getting more and more sick and more and more tired. And his heart was basically working so, so hard um, and basically like twice as hard as any other kid his age. So he would, um, you know, he'd be eating dinner and he would just get really tired um, or like he'd be running around and he'd get really tired. Um, and so eventually we had to, um, we scheduled surgery for him and, um, and it's interesting, like you think that, okay, you schedule this heart surgery and this is when it's going to happen. Like, and you like build up, you know, everything all around this one, this one day, this one moment. Mm -hmm. And so we had planned on it being um, a couple of summers ago. And then they ended up pushing it back because they're like, oh, it, like there's some tissue around the hole. It looks like it might close. Um, so then we pushed it back um, and waited like six more months. And then, um, and then it still didn't look like it was closing. So then we, um, you know, we scheduled the surgery and then, then he got sick. <laughs> and so we rescheduled it again. Um, and so by the time it was, had finally happened, like we had spent so much time like talking with him about like what it meant and like who he was and, um, and kind of the sound of his heart. We had talked about it like it was his heart song and like the sound of who he was. Um, and so he was not in any way kind of afraid to be there. Um, he was more just interested. Like, so he's getting his blood drawn and he's like, what are they doing? Like, what are they doing with like the, the needles? And like, where's the blood going? And what are we gonna do with it? Um, um, and so for him, it was, kind of the stories that changed his experience and the way that he thought about it and even the way we talk about it now with him. I love that heart song, but I think after that touching story, I'd like a brief moment here. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a break for a couple of minutes and we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Eric Bergman. As a member of TV Toastmasters, I get to learn all about video production, running a TV show, Plus, I get to be on camera interviewing really fascinating Toastmasters who share their stories about their hobbies, their activities, and how they benefit our community. I also get to bring in members of my home Toastmasters club, We Toasted in Lake Oswego. They get to tell their stories and build their communication skills. We're bringing a voice for District 7 Toastmasters here in Oregon and Southwest Washington to a TV audience. And TV Toastmasters is a great way to learn how to spread your message and share your stories with a wider audience. Welcome back to TV Toastmasters. I'm here with Kate Ristow, an author, folklorist, teacher, mom, and a fascinating person. We've already talked to her a little bit, but now I'd like to talk about since you taught and became a full-time writer. What led you to change and pursue writing full-time instead of teaching? So I think it was, it was mainly, you know, juggling all those balls in the air um, and wanting to tell these stories and wanting to write these stories. But at the same time, like when I teach, I'm so fully involved and I want it to be like a really transforming experience for my students too. Um, so I was putting so much of my time into that and then also trying to figure out like, you know, how am I a good mom and how am I a good wife and how do I do all of these things all at the same time? Um, so basically it just became a, I think this one ball needs to go over here for a little while. Um, and that ball was, was teaching. Um, but then eventually as I sorted things out and figured things out, I've picked that teaching ball back up and I've, you know, I teach workshops and I teach at conferences um, and I mentor and I uh, do a lot of critiquing with new writers. So that teaching aspect is really, really important to me. Um, but it was just the being in the classroom piece that I couldn't do every day. And commuting back and forth mm -hmm, to the classroom. Commuting back and forth to Western. And we talked about critiquing new writers and working with writers. So a lot of people out there are wondering, how do I become a writer? I've got these stories, these ideas. What do I do? Any tips or suggestions for them? 
So my biggest piece of advice is just to write and to write the story that you want to write and the story that you want to tell and not worrying about like, am I doing it right? Like, what are people going to think about it? Um, because it's uh, Anne Lamott in a book called Bird by Bird talks about like your first draft being like a child's draft where you just write and you write the story and you don't worry about anyone outside of that room because what matters in that first draft is you like and you getting to tell your story. Um, so that's really what I focus on in my like early drafts is writing the story I want and for me that means like a lot of dialogue and a lot of action and things are happening and there's not a lot of world building. Um, but then, you know, when you're ready and when you think you're done, like being okay with opening the door and sharing that with someone. Because in that sharing part, that's when you really see what you need to work on and what you need to improve because you see it through a reader's eyes instead of through a writer's eyes. Writing is only part of it. Mm -hmm. Beyond writing, there's getting published, there's promoting and advertising and lectures, as you've talked mm -hmm. about, or whatever, depending on the author. What about all the rest of it? Do you have a whole team of people, or is that your family, or <laughs> who does all that other stuff? Um, the teams of people, um, and it depends on what the project is. And I think that's one of the things that uh, people don't realize is um, just kind of the community that you have to build around yourself as a writer, um, because there's only so much time you can spend walled up in your room, like, you know, typing and writing your story. like. The reality of like being a writer is, you know, going to writing events and seeing other writers and seeing what they're doing and how you could do it differently or how you think about writing differently. So a lot of my writing has changed in response to like working with other writers and seeing what they do. Um, so yeah, a whole community of people. My um, my number one um, number one editor is my mom, um, and she always will be. She's a she's an eighth grade English teacher, and she reads my first drafts, and you know she says. Hey, this is really, really great, but, uh -oh. <laughs> and then whatever that but is, I'm like, oh yeah, like I can fix that, that's easy, you know, and then I start to fix it, and um, it starts to take longer and longer, and then I finally like, yeah, I, I, I see what she was doing there, like, <laughs> she's got it figured out, but she makes me feel confident in my writing, but then at the same time, like, lets me know that it's okay to change it. It reminds me of the children's book, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie. Mm -hmm. so Which is one of her another. favorite books. Ah, great. <laughs> as long as you get cookies. Wow. And you talk about working with other writers as well as critiquing them, teaching them, and about the community. And you are executive director of Willamette Writers Group. Mm -hmm. Want to talk about that at all a little bit? Yeah. So um, it's... it's a, a organization that I've been excited about and working with and volunteering with for a long time. Um, you know, I would go to their workshops and I'd go to their critique sessions and I'd go to their conference. Um, and then over time I realized that like, I wanted to see like what people were doing and I wanted to help. Um, and so then I started volunteering and coming in behind the scenes and, um, and trying to help writers as much as I could. And um, what Willamette Writers does really, really well um, is kind of building up this community of writers and people who are working together and are sharing and are sharing information and how to be like, you know, those questions about like, how do I publish? How do I get an agent? What do I do with this query letter? Like, um, what if I do, what do I do with my, this agent that I've written to hasn't responded to me in a month? So. All these questions that like other writers have and other writers know the answers to and just being okay with like um, sharing them. And that's really what Willamette Writers is about, is about, is about creating that community and helping you improve your craft and, and also develop your career. So taking your career kind of the next step that you need. So it sounds like it's a group of the new writer, the experienced writer, the learning writer, learning all the ropes and mm -hmm. so on. Just all those walks getting together and sharing? Yeah, we always talk about it's basically the mission is all writers. So it's not just people who are Willamette writers, it's like the entire community of writers. So the conference is aimed at helping everyone at every step along the way. So sometimes, um, you know, you'll have people who are coming in who have published like four or five books or like who are um, New York Times bestsellers, like learning alongside somebody who um, you know, is still working on that first draft or like, um, you know, as a magazine article writer or a nonfiction writer. Um, and so there's no genre, um, genre restrictions. There's screenwriting and there's science fiction and fantasy and there's romance and there's mystery and there's all those genres all working together and, and figuring out. Yeah, and folklorists. <laughs> well, we're not Willamette Writers Group, but we do have people that are probably interested in some of that before they even entertain the idea of finding that group and becoming a member. Mm -hmm. 
So how do you find your ideas to write, what to write? My ideas for what to write, um, some of them come out of like mythology and old stories and stories that I've heard. Um, sometimes I'm a little bit negative and sometimes they'll come out of stories that I've heard and I want them to be different or like characters that I want to see that like aren't there. So with Charlie and Clockbreakers, you know, she's in a wheelchair and there just weren't those stories about like, um, you know, in kids books about kids with disabilities and dealing with disabilities and like, um, you know, showing what like their lives are like. Um, and so really Clockbreakers came out of that of um, my next door neighbor uh, is this like really smart, smart uh, talented um, young woman who um, had scoliosis, so she was going to have back surgery. So then it was that question of like, where are the books for people in wheelchairs? Where are the books for people who are like kind of dealing with these issues? So we write them if there we can't find go. them. <laughs> That's what we have to do. If yeah. We can't find them. If you could go back and make one change in your career choice, not teach but start with writing, or not give up the teaching when you did for writing, or whatever. What might that one change be? Hmm. I don't hugely have um, one change in my career choice, but I would make one change in like my understanding of writing, um, because I think early on, you know, I worked with uh, at Illinois State University in undergrad. I was an English major, um, and so I took a creative writing course and several creative writing courses. And one of the courses was taught by David Foster Wallace and. David Foster Wallace is like, an amazing writer. Um, he, he wrote these really, really meticulously detailed books um, and very postmodern. Um, and he wanted us to do big and amazing things. Um, and I wanted to write stories that were just funny and interesting. <laughs> and so it was kind of this back and forth with me and him about um, you know, trying to write something that's serious and trying to write something that is monumental. And also, like, I really just wanted to write a, like, a story like, that people would read. Um, so learning to kind of respect myself in the story that I wanted to tell too. Well, that's an important lesson, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think we all need those big epic stories that make us think about a lot of things. But we need those entertaining shorter stories that we can read quickly, that we can get something out of. Just, maybe just entertainment, mm -hmm. just a laugh, maybe more than that. Mm -hmm. I think you're sharing some great ideas. Um, has your process of writing changed since you first started? Definitely. Um, it's changed both in as I've learned more and more, and it's also changed uh, just uh, situationally. Like, um, you know, I, I sometimes say that writers like need to change by the seasons of their life. Like, because, you know, when, when you're writing before you have a kid, like it's completely different from when you're writing after you have a kid or when you're writing when you're in college and, you know, you're working on all these other things um, and your life is so busy. Um, so kind of finding the, the writing life that works for you. So for me now, um, when I write the first drafts of books, I, I sit down and I have, um, you know, an empty notebook and I just like hand write the entire first draft. Um, and that's because I sometimes get stuck on something like, I need to describe like this guy's tie. Like, how am I going to describe this tie? And, you know, I'll just get stuck on this tie. And if I'm just handwriting it and I'm, and I'm just focusing on the draft and getting the ideas out, I'll just say, parentheses, describe tie, and then move on um, and focus on kind of the story and what matters um, and then coming back to it later. So that's my process has changed more to focus on like just telling the story you want to tell and enjoy it and have fun and then then come back and, and edit and revise and change and get help from people when when you need it. Well, we're running out of time, but I want to make sure people know how to reach out to you. How would they reach you? Yeah, so you can easily get a hold of me on um, katerestaw.com, which is my email. And or sorry, it's my website, but then you can find my email there and you can find out more about me too. Thank you, Kate. It's been a pleasure. Thank I've you, Kate. talking with you. Kate Ristow, Executive Director of Willamette Writers Group, teacher, writer, mom, whole gamut of things she does. Thank you for jo uh, joining us tonight. I hope you enjoyed the show. Hi, I'm Phyllis Harmon. I'm a member of TV Toastmasters. In this club, we have an opportunity to practice speaking before the camera, as well as running the equipment room. If you're interested in being interviewed on TV Toastmasters or becoming a member, please go to Toastmasters org and look for us or simply search for TV Toastmasters on the web.